Beautiful night, uh, sunny afternoon, and here we are to see a wonderful lecture. Uh, my name is Mark Morris, I'm head of teaching at the AA, and it is a real pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Sue Barr, who will be speaking on the architecture of transit, photographing the sublime in the landscape of motorway architecture. Dr. Barr is head of photography. Um, she took her PhD from the Royal College of Art. Uh, but what's most important, uh, to me at least, a project near and dear to my heart, she is uh, our inaugural um, research publications fellow, uh, working this year on a book which is tightly bound up to the lecture you're going to see this evening. I first met Sue in her photo lab lair downstairs uh, to, I think we were supposed to look at your Cartier Foundation work, and we were interrupted about every three minutes. A student needed a tripod, another student needed to check something out, another student said the lighting had fallen down and was starting a fire. <laughs> and Sue jumped up in a rapid fire way, just handled every crisis and came right back uh, to where we had left off in a kind of smooth transition and regained focus very swiftly. Uh, so to me, it's uh, no surprise that the object of her lecture and her recent research is the motorway, a space of speed and solidity, of ambiguous scale and the sublime. Sue promised me this evening we'd see this other side of her, which I think is interesting. She's given two decades of service to this school, and we get to see a new side of you tonight. That's, that's pretty fantastic. She called it the um, train spotting geek side, and uh, I, think, I think we'll find uh, that that will be the last piece of the puzzle uh, that we'll need in your profile. I think there's something important um, to reading the work for me when I always look at... Um, Sue's uh, photographs, I notice the crop, I notice the edges first. She's a master of what's held uh, in frame and what moves beyond it. And I think a lot of her interest in uh, defining the sublime through her work is bound up in what's beyond. So look for that this evening. Uh, Christian Hubert, uh, writing a beautiful essay in the uh, Idea as Model book, he talked about this relationship, this oddly intimate, long-standing relationship between architecture and photography, uh, where photography sort of exceeds its normal documentary function when it comes to architecture. He called it uh, motivated representation. And I think we're all motivated uh, to see what Sue has in store for us this evening. So please help me welcome Dr. Barr. Hello. Hey, Rose. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming. It's really nice to see you all. Um, yeah, so I'm going to show you basically my kind of PhD research project that um, I won the bursary research fellowship bursary thing for and uh, kind of explain what I've been doing, maybe because it's a bit odd for the past seven years or so. So. Um, just bear with me, I just want to show a little bit of context about what I've done before because everything kind of combines to sort of lead up to this. Um, I've always kind of been interested in concrete and brutalism and things like that and I worked on a book with Simon Henley on the architecture of parking and um, photographed lots of kind of parking structures uh, in England and uh, in the States for that. And um, I work a lot with David Heathcote, who's a writer and historian, and we've done lots of projects together over the years, kind of books and films and many things, really. Um, but the ones that kind of have helped kind of take me to where I'm trying to go now with my work are the Barbican Project and the 70s House uh, books that we did. Um, when you're working, this, when you're working as a photographer, you spend a lot of time in the car, and there's a lot of time travelling and a lot of time driving. And we spent a lot of time in Greece working on the 70s house book, and 
it kind of got us interested in roads and kind of road development and we got interested in the Ignatia Odos project which was in northern Greece and so we did a kind of project on that which is part of a bigger project of a book that David's writing I think he's kind of finished just about um, but we also looked at a lot of kind of old roads as well that we were interested in um, the Calderimi and, and also the things under construction and it was this sort of mega scale of these things that started to kind of get my interest in this kind of architecture really um, part of the the roads book uh, led to kind of working in America and um, we did a project on the Lincoln Highway which was America's first cross-country road and I took this somewhere in Nebraska I can't actually remember where it was which isn't very good of me from my archive but um, the Lincoln Highway was the first officially kind of measured road across the states in 1913 and it was measured at 300 and 3,389 miles at the time. I think the route has um, subsequently been altered and uh, changed. So we did this project anyway, and it, it starts in Times Square in New York and goes all the way across the country and finishes in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. And um, it's just this idea again of this kind of enormous scale dealing with something so large and there's some really interesting points in the in the road or what's left of the road it's in different states in different stages and states of repair in different places and in some of it it follows the pony express trail um, some of it's been preserved you can see bits where it's been paved there's a really amazing bit there one with the yellow line at the top which is where i think the engineers have actually kind of stamped the road or stamped the concrete which was kind of an amazing thing to see kind of the proud kind of manufacturer of their road. Um, the image on the left, on the far left in the middle, is the point of the beginning, which is kind of really interesting and geeky, maybe, that it's the point at which um, the kind of west of America was mapped and measured from. So it was the point of the beginning of the, the expansion west. Um, so we did these projects and was kind of looking at this kind of enormous enormous kind of scale and um, it all kind of combined together to through lots of traveling and lots of different kind of projects but the one picture really that kind of um, that started my kind of interest in all of this thing was this piece of, well, it's, it's kind of a drive-by shooting for the want of a better word really it's just a kind of um, snapshot I made near Genoa but um, it was just the kind of extraordinary piece of architecture, this sort of climbing and striding across the landscape and just the enormous kind of scale of it, really. And it made me kind of interested in kind of how I could think about that as a photographer and how I could think about that to sort of document and, and make a piece of work or make a, a project about it, really. Um, so I realised I started, I wanted to do a PhD because it's something I kind of wanted to take my, my practice or I wanted to kind of develop it because I've been working for a long time as a commercial photographer and, you know, that's great and everything, but it's just you kind of get set in your ways of working and you kind of have this sort of methodology of shooting and you don't necessarily push yourself and you learn, but not quite in the way that I was interested in doing. So I had this idea to, to work on a, or try and undertake a PhD, but thinking about these kind of large scale structures that I've been looking at and this kind of idea of a mega structure that we'd sort of thought about and seen in the work that we'd done in kind of the roads projects and the projects in Greece and this kind of, this sort of mega scale stuff that we we're interested in. So um, I started off, I luckily, I was lucky enough to get a place at the Royal College in the architecture department there, rather than photography actually. I think that's kind of interested, that was interesting for me because um, I think I, even though I'm a photographer, I I feel more comfortable working in an architectural environment rather than within the photography department, really. But um, so I started the project beginning kind of thinking about kind of precedents, really thinking about kind of epic scale. I mean, these are both very kind of familiar images to everyone, but Christo and John Claude and the Super Studio. But this, it was this idea of a kind of representation, really, of, uh, of a megastructure. And, 
and how and how you can kind of deal with that and how you can capture that as a photographer i mean it's kind of uh, boggles your brain really somewhat to be honest but um so i started looking into kind of uh roots and kind of um scale and thinking about kind of the architecture of the road as one piece of architecture, really, the sort of enormous European motorway network system and the idea of this kind of concrete ribbon sort of laying across Europe, laying across the landscape, something that starts up on the Finnish border and then finishes in Sicily. So it was this idea how you can kind of deal with that, kind of how you conceptualise it, how you can kind of work with it, how you can make how you can make a project out of that, really. Um, I found this quote by Carl Andre, which I really liked, this idea about a road as being a piece of sculpture. So, so that's kind of where it started from, the beginnings of the project, just trying to understand what would be potential, what would be possible for a kind of uh, research project. So with the kind of this sort of engineering photography, there's this sort of tradition and this kind of archetype of the heroic viewpoint really um i mean representations of this bridge are kind of obvious really everything is tends to be from a kind of helicopter or you know now i guess it would be shot from a drone so this isn't really something that i was kind of interested in or I didn't have a helicopter but it wasn't something i could possibly kind of access working in this way but it wasn't really what i wanted to do it wasn't what i was interested in doing phot photographically um so at the beginning of kind of uh, phd projects you need to sort of look at what's around you need to look at kind of books and, and precedents and see what other things that people have been writing really um and there's a lot of kind of dry academic and engineering kind of um, treaties about these kind of subjects, really. Um, and this kind of whole series, the motorway achievement, which is about British motorways. But there's also kind of art books looking at it, but not nothing that's kind of so systematic or kind of organized in the way that I wanted a, a kind of research project to be, really. Um, I'm talking really fast. I, um, so the beginning of the project was really how you can make pictures of roads. I mean, the problem being that actually they're quite boring a lot of the time and there isn't really anything happening. And um, this idea actually that the architecture is kind of invisible within the road, you know, it's all buried underneath the surface and, um, you know, how on earth are you going to make a, a photograph of that really? Um, the quote from Dickens is actually talking about northern France, which is from uh, pictures from Italy, which I'm going to talk about a bit later. But um, it kind of this is the problem of the this kind of landscape. It's like where is your photograph? Where is the thing that you're actually going to going to make a picture from? How are you going to form a, a project out of this? So. I started off shooting in, um, in Basel. Um, Basel was a city that I was interested in because it's on the borders and um, of all the different countries, France and Germany. And, and um, I was just trying to investigate how the motorway works in this city. I use the term motorway because autobahn, autostrada, depending, but um, because the because the, more, the motorway works right through the city, it's really kind of brutal in the way that it kind of dissects through the city. I thought it was a really interesting place to kind of start off. And you can see in this image on the right, you know, the curve of the, well, it's on, on off ramp, but is right next to an apartment block. So it was this kind of extraordinary condition of kind of living with the kind of motorway. Um, but these early kind of stage, these early kind of pictures I made, I, I wasn't really kind of happy with them in a sense that they, I think that they tap into this idea of a kind of um, banal aesthetic really. And um, this is something that's kind of really, really dominant in kind of art photography. Maybe things are slightly changing now, but um, it's when I was at art school, you know, 
the Beckers and the kind of Dusseldorf school were the kind of really dominant force in photography and you know no one was really interested in history particularly with a f with a few exceptions and so I felt that the pictures that I was making were they were kind of flat somehow visually flat and this kind of um, this aesthetic where things are kind of desaturated and I felt like it wasn't really kind of doing anything. I wasn't really pushing myself. I mean, part of the thing of doing a PhD is that it has to be an original contribution to knowledge. So you're, if it's a PhD by practice, which mine was, you have to be kind of exploring your practice and actually expanding it and challenging yourself. And I felt that these kind of pictures, you know, as much as they're kind of, I like the geometries of them, I like the lines and, you know, I like being an architectural photographer, I like everything lined up and, and really straight, but um, I felt there was something kind of, yeah, something slightly missing from them really. So I think this kind of dominance of the kind of Dusseldorf school is a sort of overbearing kind of presence. I mean, I think this is changing now, but um, when I started this project kind of on and off seven years ago it's how I felt about photography so I kind of decided that I would revisit art history and uh, which sounds a kind of odd thing to say but I would sort of look at history of landscape painting and the construction of landscape imagery and how it was done before and you know get past this kind of photographic modernism and see what else was around and it's stuff that i hadn't looked at properly for years and we didn't really ever kind of touch upon in um in art school um so i st i just started looking at things like color and form and shape and construction and um it's a bit strange maybe the the pairing of this uh painting by Patineer and then my picture of Salerno but um I really like the way that the shape of the roads echo each other so it was kind of just a a kind of interesting I think it's always great to put images together to see how they play off each other so yeah, so I started kind of going back to the beginning and looking at kind of at landscape painting and the construction of landscape painting. And, you know, basically it was just an excuse to hang out at the National Gallery and just spend my time looking at amazing, amazing paintings. So I spent a long time looking at kind of Claude and Poussin and Turner's and all of these paintings looking at how you know they were constructed the kind of color palette that they use the kind of tone I was also interested in this kind of idea of the narrative within the paintings and how you know things like argument and paragon and all of these kind of techniques of construction were used and how the paintings were framing the view, particularly with the respect to perspective, actually, the way that, you know, colour, particularly in paintings like this, which is one of my favourites by Patineer, the, the use of colour to sort of suggest a sort of depth within the painting and the idea of these kind of different narratives occurring within the painting. It's kind of this idea of, of time, which photography can't really deal with, obviously, in the same way. But, you know, I just became absolutely fascinated by this. And it became really, really useful to sort of look at these things. I mean, I only put in two examples here, but I spent a long time just kind of going through all of them, trying to work out differences and similarities and kind of connections between things and stuff. And obviously doing kind of reading around this and lots of Turner's, um, the great Turner. So I continued looking through kind of landscape imagery, kind of chronologically really sort of, maybe using the kind of National Gallery as my kind of my library really because I I mean I looked at other stuff but maybe mainly the National because the collection is so fantastic and everything is there and the way it kind of works so I kind of went through looking at allegorical paintings and the picturesque and the beautiful these kind of art traditions and classifications and kind of came to the sublime as a kind of natural progression through my uh, research really and um, 
became particularly interested within, with this idea of the kind of the Gotthard, the Gotthard mountain pass in Switzerland and the representations of that by Turner and different artists that had painted it and, you know, poets like Ruskin and, and different people who'd kind of traveled through it. And um, because it was so kind of iconic as a mountain pass in Switzerland, so it was a kind of, again, just kind of trying to familiarize myself or re-familiarize myself with these things. And also obviously seeing work that I'd never seen before, but just these amazing, amazing paintings. It's just an incredible sort of education, really, to have the experience of looking at them. And um, another, another work that became really, really important was this uh, painting by de Lutherberg of an avalanche in the Alps. Um, and this again, it becomes this kind of idea of the sublime and um, it's the kind of, through looking through the kind of chronologi chronological representations of picturesque and beautiful, you kind of come to the sublime and romanticism. And um, yeah, it was the kind of the power of this painting really with the sort of the dwarfing of the, the tiny figures in the kind of the avalanche and the sort of the power of nature. I mean, it's, see this is a very good image on the screen but you can see the the kind of the power and the emotion that these paintings have when you see them in 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 the gallery they're kind of incredible things so this was kind of quite a sort of pivotal sort of point in um, the research project really kind of discovering this kind of work and also of course the sort of aesthetics and the kind of <laughs> the aesthetics and the kind of um, the literature and the kind of the philosophy that goes with this. And at the same time, I was also reading kind of travel literature from this period as well, because I got really fascinated in this idea of kind of, of traveling and you know, kind of reading Shelley and people like that. And then uh, Dickens pictures from Italy and just the way that they talked about this kind of landscape and talked about the power of the landscape and just the kind of making it this sort of almost human, this kind of idea of sort of threat, which is, I, talk, I want to talk in a minute about the kind of sublime in more detail, but just where you can see where Shelley says about their immensity staggers the imagination and so far surpasses all conception that it requires an effort of understanding to believe that they indeed form a part of the earth. So it's this incredibly kind of powerful kind of uh, language that they use and uh, Dickens as well. So which is what I looked at here. So this is pictures from Italy. So this uh, map on the left is a map of his travels. And this is a really, really fantastic read. And um, it was really a revelation to read stuff like this. I mean, I just had no kind of experience of this kind of work at all. But obviously this kind of tradition of looking at the landscape paintings and kind of thinking around constructions of landscape, it all kind of works together. It kind of brings brings these ideas together. And it also then brings to, into the kind of conversation, for want of a better word, it brings in the idea of the grand tour. And um, this is kind of quite a, a major sort of theme around this time. And prior, obviously prior to the grand tour, there was no kind of cult of the countryside in a sense. So um, travelers would sort of be scared of the mountains, the idea of kind of having to cross the Alps prior to the kind of idea of the sublime and romanticism. Crossing the Alps was this kind of nightmarish, perilous, perilous journey, you know, that it was both difficult to cross the mountains and then there were these kind of bandits, as they were called, waiting to rob them at every turn. So it was this kind of idea of the sort of fear of these people. But then, of course, with the development of this idea of the sublime, and it, it turned into something entirely different and it turned into this kind of search for the sublime within within the paintings and then within the kind of the travels of these people you know then they began to look for this they wanted to experience safely I should say safely an experience of the sublime whilst they were on their grand tour really so they were kind of looking at things that they had experienced in paintings this is kind of what they wanted to find so so I was looking at kind of 
concurrently the paintings and also the kind of the literature from this time. Also read uh, Goethe's Travels in Italy, which is also great because he's actually quite moany. It's kind of interesting to to read him really. But so. This, uh, and looking at the maps of the kind of routes they took, there was a kind of very much a sort of traditional map or traditional route of the, all of these travels. And I really liked the idea that kind of um, civilization ended in Naples. You know, nobody really went past there occasionally to Sicily or onto Greece, but generally it kind of it ended there. So this became something that was kind of taking quite a hold in the project is quite an important kind of um, a part of the journey, uh, part of the the project in this idea of kind of finding a field of study because you know when you sort of take on a PhD project it sort of fluctuates between being something that's kind of achievable and then you kind of drowning in the idea that it's completely impossible and you can never finish it or never do it and the idea of trying to photograph all the europe all the motorways in europe was just nuts so somehow i had to find some kind of um field of study uh, to sort of define the project and actually bring it down into being something that was kind of manageable so that's where this kind of idea of the grand tour comes in um, and then I read this book by Burke, um, which becomes kind of one of the major books of the project, really. Um, and he talks about this idea of the sublime. It's his kind of treatise, and he kind of lists the causes and specific definitions and cate categorizations and classifications of the sublime. And he, and he it's quite a kind of in-depth book, and... I don't know if anyone has read it, but, you know, it's kind of very, very precise about its kind of categorization of what causes the sublime, what doesn't, and, re and also in regards to the beautiful, but that, oops, I've missed off the L. <laughs> um, but that's not quite what I'm going to get into. But so he think, he says things like uh, darkness, obscurity, vastness, height, mountains, deserts, the stormy ocean, the infinity of space, the ungraspably vast or formless, and of course, the absolute power of God are things that kind of have a property of the sublime about them. So this was a really, really important book to read, and it really helped me to kind of understand what I was doing, and I'm going to talk about um, the kind of development on from this book in a minute. But, I mean, the book is filled with amazing, amazing quotes, but um, if you'll just allow me to read one more, and it's, whatever is fitted in any sort to excite the ideas of pain and danger, that is to say, whatever is in any sort terrible or is conversant about terrible objects, or operates in a manner anag analogous, can't say the word, to terror, is a source of the sublime. That is, it is productive of the strongest emotion which, which the mind is capable of feeling. So this is what he's talking about, this kind of overpowering kind of emotional response to things. But there's also built into that, I mean, it's a very complex, complicated book but built into this is the idea of danger and jeopardy but it's this kind of idea of the immensity and a, an, an enormity of an emotional response to something that I became really kind of interested in and particularly because the sublime is such an overused term and is something that you know people use nowadays I mean obviously the w words change their meaning but I was really interested in this original idea of it and how it has it is a things can be a trigger for this kind of emotional response really and how I might be able to use that within looking at architecture of motorways which kind of sounds quite strange but it's all about trying to find a methodology for working and um, so from Burke I started to and from Burke and looking at the kind of um, the Grand Tour and the traditions of the Grand Tour and the kind of roots of the Grand Tour and things I started to look at where I could work um, and where would be kind of logistic to kind of shoot and try to be containable really. So I started looking at the kind of Swiss and Italian motorway networks as you do. And um, these are the kind of roots of them, but I was also really interested in the kind of topography. I mean, these are just 
quick grabs off Google, but um, I was interested in the kind of idea of the mountainous areas and how the motorways worked within that and how they would have to kind of negotiate these mountainous areas, particularly kind of in Switzerland and in the north of Italy and things like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is what I was looking at here, trying to kind of define a sort of, uh, a kind of field of study, really, as a way of kind of having parameters for the project, really. Um, so at the same time as looking at all this kind of amazing art history and painting and kind of reading these fantastic kind of 18th century books about traveling in Italy, I was also looking at kind of photographic history and really O'Sullivan is the man that we have to kind of consult with. Um, his just was the most amazing kind of photographer working at this period. I mean, he, oh, I turn it into a lecture about O'Sullivan, but um, so he was working, uh, he worked photographing in the Civil War, but after that he worked on the kind of geological survey expeditions in America where America was expanding west. And so he was one of the main photographers. There was a, a group of them, but he, him and, uh, I had completely gone blank on the others, the names of them. But anyway, I looked a lot at O'Sullivan's work. Um, and it's absolutely amazing images. I mean, they really, really relate to landscape painting, which I guess is the kind of obvious connection in a way, really, because, you know, there wouldn't be photography for them to be referenced again. But, you know, the pictures that were made in such extraordinary conditions, all shot kind of on, on glass plates and things like that. Um, so O'Sullivan is a kind of really important person in the kind of history of sort of landscape painting and, I'm sorry, uh, landscape photography. I also looked at kind of uh, photography that was used kind of more for sort of mapping and on kind of colonial expeditions in India and Burma and places like that. So the amazingly named Linnaeus Tripe, which is such a fantastic name for a photographer. And, um, and Charles Marville, who obviously worked a lot in Paris. And they were interesting photographers because they had a very kind of systematic approach to photography and their kind of relationship to architecture and how they used photography. This kind of idea of the camera as being a kind of surveying tool. And so, you know, they would especially uh, Linnaeus Tripe, who would kind of make these very systematic views of temples and kind of shooting every elevation. And it was a very much a kind of documenting and kind of mapping project. But this was kind of a nice ex uh, excuse to hang out in the Royal Geographical Society Library, which, uh, or the photo archive as well, which is kind of amazing. Um, but I kind of, there was something about the neutrality of these kind of pictures that I wasn't wasn't so interested in, in a way. Um, I mean, they can, you could talk about them being kind of faithful somehow, but I was interested in something that was much more, making pictures that were much more sort of, had a moreness to them, which is something that uh, I talked about in kind of tutorials. So with the, these ideas, this kind of, um, these references of O'Sullivan, of the landscape paintings and things like that, I started to try and make, make pictures and um, I thought about architectural and photographic typologies and how the kind of, how the motorway works within the landscape, within the city and this idea of over and under and through the city and, you know, thinking about cuttings and tunnels and entrances and galleries and these kind of things, these kind of things that could almost be sort of ticked off as a way of kind of documenting and, and kind of shooting. And I think this kind of relates to Burke a bit in a way, in the sense of having this kind of classification and having this kind of, I really, I really like boxes and ticking boxes and everything to be neat and, and tidy. And the idea of just having a checklist of things that I could go and shoot was just somehow <laughs> pleasing. But obviously that would just make a really boring project. So um, this was a kind of a sort of an investigation that I made, but I don't know, kind of uh, 
I decided to work on it uh, on on kind of other things which I'll, I'll talk to you about. So I decided that I needed a kind of case study site and um, I decided to work in Genoa, first of all, Genoa, Genoa. Um, and this is an interesting city, I mean, historically, um, because of the kind of the roots of the motorway and the motorway starting here and kind of the port and the importance of the port. Um, but. I'm not the expert to talk about this. I think David should be the one talking about this. But this was a this city was a, a good place to start because of the kind of dominance of the motorway around, kind of circling through the city. So I started to kind of try and investigate how the motorway worked within the city, and um, so I spent a lot of time looking at maps and kind of things like that but then of course Google Earth you know it's sort of impossible to resist the temptations of just trawling around on Google Earth so I spent a lot of time looking at kind of things looking for kind of moments looking you know bearing in mind this idea of kind of um, this astonishment this extraordinary kind of response um, I think in the thesis, which I've kind of managed to completely forget now, having written it, but I think I said something about an extraordinary architectural moment or incident or something like that. I think I defined it in that way. So I was kind of trying to f identify these sites within the city. Um, there's a lot to say about Google pros and cons, but um, it helped me to try and kind of find uh, sites and find places to shoot. And um, that's not to say the entire project was based on Google Earth, but um, there's, I'm going to talk a bit later about the problems of that as well. But these are some of the beginning pictures I made in Genoa. And um, it's funny, this, the picture on the left, people often think it's photoshopped, but um, it's not. <laughs> So um, I was interested in this kind of proximity and this kind of enormity and power and kind of strength of the architecture. Um, yeah, and so these are other investigations I made. S something to talk about a bit later maybe is this idea of kind of diptychs and how pictures work together. You know, sometimes they work individually, sometimes they work as groups. But um, I mean, after taking them, I kind of realised that they, obviously they go together, they were shot in kind of near enough the same place, but there's, there's something kind of quite nice about placing them together. And now that they've been placed together, I can't ever separate them. I can't look at one picture without the other. But um, yeah, so there's a lot of time kind of uh, looking and, and, and observing, but that's kind of what I wanted to talk about now, actually, this idea of quickly looking and slowly seeing, which is was quite an important thing um, to write about in the thesis. And um, Thoreau said, the question is not what you look at, but what you see. And I think this is, I think this is a really important thing. And my students will always kind of tell you that I just bang on about using a tripod the whole time, but it's this idea of really kind of slowing down and looking and, and really, really observing through the viewfinder. And because I use a large format camera, you have that luxury of having a large kind of ground glass screen that you can actually look at the world through. And it's something where you just need to look and look and look, whether it's with a 35 mil or whatever, with a waist level finder or however you're observing the world, you just need to look and, and really think about how things work and how perspectives work and stuff. It's kind of great when you look at the world through um, a ground glass, ground glass screen because everything is upside down and it gives you this uh, amazing kind of distance in a way. Um, it's almost like when I was at school, I remember one of my art teachers saying to look at drawings in a mirror. And it's just this idea of kind of sort of seeing something but being slightly kind of removed from it in a way. But just this idea of kind of looking and the camera, luckily, it's, it's a really nice way of shooting to have this really kind of extended look. And um, this is something I wrote about in the thesis, this idea of slowly, slowly seeing and um, it really helped actually to write about these things. But I just wanted to talk to you about this um, case study, um, which is um, in a place called Voltry, which is 
near Genoa. This is, um, these are the kind of maps of the site. And this is, um, the colours are awful. <laughs> they don't look this psychedelic. But um, so this is the site that I was kind of interested in. And if you look at the, uh, the maps, you can see that the, there's a kind of really complex conjunction of motorways, different motorway routes, roads, trains, there's a kind of river, the, the kind of topography is kind of steep as well. So this is the thing about kind of this long look, which is what people have talked about, or slowly seeing, or whatever the terms you want to use, because it's such a complicated place, and it's really hard to know where to put your viewfinder and how to frame it. I mean, in the end, none of these pictures actually I think I use, but I, you know, obviously the picture, the bottom right, and something kind of nice about that, the way the kind of, the legs kind of stride over the top of the building, and you see that a lot in Italy in kind of older, in, old, in older sites of motorways. But um, there's sort of a visual chaos somehow, particularly in this uh, bottom left image. I mean, I, I show these pictures sort of saying that I don't think they work really, but, um, it's just trying to find a way to frame this and to sort of uh, to find the to find the answer to the question of this site, so to speak. So in the end, this is the uh, this is the image I made, which is actually slightly further to the left. But what I was interested in this in in a lot of the pictures now is this kind of these ideas of proximity and the kind of space or lack of space and kind of scale and it's almost like a collage, it's almost like a kind of composite somehow, but it's real and just this kind of squashing together and then at the bottom of the picture, I haven't got a point, uh, you know, there's a, a kind of underpass under the, under the train line, so there's kind of this enormous sort of power of the image. I'm obviously not comparing myself to Piranesi, but I was looking at um, these uh, the prison etching series at the time and I was just really interested in this kind of complexity of the the image and the intensity and denseness of the image and I thought there was kind of something about that this kind of the combination of the two so um, then yeah so I kind of carried on shooting looking for different sites. Um, this is about, I put this in because this is about a site again where there's lots of options somehow, there's different things within the, within the location to make a photograph of. Um, this picture on the left of a little man, came, little man, a normal sized man, came into the picture with a red t-shirt on and stood there and kind of put his hand like that and I really didn't ask him to, but he sort of almost ruined the picture, I think, somehow, because it looks so crazily fake somehow. But um, this is the picture that I kind of made, the sort of picture that I decided of this, uh, of this site that I felt was kind of answering the kind of the questions or the kind of trying to answer the methodology that I was interested in. I was really interested in the kind of ruinous nature of this as well. If you look at it really carefully, you see the kind of reinforcement coming through in the concrete and the, the kind of foliage kind of threatening to over, overcome the kind of the concrete and also the little people in the background kind of, um, I was really pleased with the, they walked into the shot because of, um, because they give this idea of scale and distance. So I don't want to get into the whole thing of people in architectural photography because that's a sort of tricky subject, but um, I was pleased by their, by their uh, presence. Um, another book that I looked at that became very important was obviously this one, Everybody Knows Complex Complexity and Contradiction by Venturi. Um, particularly when he talks about these kind of, this idea of violent adjacencies and this kind of writing really, really helped to kind of solidify his ideas of how I was going to shoot um, and how I was going to create this kind of methodology. So it was kind of taking ideas from kind of Burke and the sublime and this kind of astonishment, but also this idea of kind of proximity and scale and all these kind of things. So it was kind of a combination of these readings and this kind of research that helped to make this, uh, this methodology really. And so with this kind of armed with this kind of uh, recipe in a way, I was kind of looking for kind of places to shoot. So 
I got really interested in this idea of scale and the kind of towering kind of dominance of the scale and then the kind of shadows and things like that. Um, the titles actually just as a little aside, the titles of the pictures are usually where they're shot from. There's a couple of places where I haven't actually been able to work out where I was, which sounds a bit strange because I couldn't find a name anywhere, but usually they're the locations. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm skipping ahead. Um, again, this is to do with, again, light and, and uh, kind of the extreme contrast of light and shadow. And, and again, of proximity, this idea of this kind of, you know, looking out of your balcony window and you're seeing these enormous kind of piloti kind of next to you. Um, and then these are, yeah, these are some of the, the pictures from, from this series, really. I think there's uh, differences in sort of approach from the pictures at the beginning to the pictures at the end, but I think that's natural when you work on a project. I kind of worked on and off for seven years on the project, so um, I was really interested in this in kind of intensity of light and dark, and this is particularly something that Burke talks about, this kind of um, the astonishment and the kind of fear that's kind of generated from this. Um, these spaces in Naples, this, um, this comes at the end of the sequence, but I'm going to talk about this in a minute. Uh, the colours are horrible. <laughs> I'm sorry, they're not, it doesn't look like this at all. Not quite this psychedelic, but... Um, yeah. So this is again some, somewhere where there's kind of it's just a lot to shoot. <laughs> it's just extraordinary, extraordinary place. Uh, okay. This is one of the few I shot in the snow. I didn't really do any more of those, unfortunately. Um, it's a problem when you work on a, on a project for such a long time, how, you know, your ideas change about it, about the work and the project, which is kind of good, which is what you want, but also there's always the problem when you're on site and you're shooting and you kind of get hijacked by something. And this is, I show this as an example of that. This is in, um, again, in, in amazing Naples. This is a bridge that was kind of cut off and it was just really weird and random and, um, you know, the site was too, shoot, too tight to kind of shoot it in a way, and I'm not really sure that m any of these pictures kind of really nail it particularly, but, you know, it's something that I was really interested in, and the, the kind of the visual chaos of it, and just this extraordinary thing of this bridge just being cut off, but it kind of became a sort of tangent to the project, which is great because, you know, you're working and you're finding, you're kind of finding pictures, but there's always this problem of things kind of sidetracking you and kind of taking you off, and you always have to be thinking about what the pictures are about. I put this in because this was <laughs> such a sort of potentially such an amazing place to take pictures and it was just didn't work at all um this is in the abruzzo and um there's something about shadows on a map uh, in well in google that kind of always sort of makes you think ah there might be something going on there something interesting and obviously google is shot from the road i'm not interested in making pictures from the road but you know it's just the most extraordinary piece of of road that kind of maps and and follows the kind of mountains, but when you're down on the on the street level, it's kind of impossible to shoot. It was just couldn't get it to work. You know, it's the way that the camera is kind of democratic and it shows everything. And there's something about when you look at a scene and when you read a scene or a scene as in a view and in a landscape, we we don't see it in the same way. And um, there's an interesting essay by uh, Burkhart about this where he talks about how you kind of just fill in the dots somehow. It's just, you know, you take bits and you d don't take other bits, but the camera doesn't work like that. The camera shoots everything. And so I just couldn't get this to work, which was unfortunate. And the picture on the right 
is not good, but I'm, I'm showing it in the, <laughs> the spirit of, and maybe it's interesting to see things <laughs> that don't work. The other uh, problem, or problem with, the, with this kind of project or taking these pictures is actually, there in, sometimes you see things that you just can't shoot, you know, because there's nowhere to stop or the kind of, they're inaccessible, the location is kind of inaccessible. This is a kind of experience of anyone who's driven around Genoa. You have this amazing experience of driving into a tunnel and come out of the kind of blinding light and you're kind of, it's like being in a computer game, you're kind of, it's strobing almost, and especially in the summer when it's so hot, but you know, it's an amazing film to be made, but it's not something that can be shot. And, um, you know, it's almost like it doesn't exist. There's not anything that you can really shoot. Um, when I was preparing for this lecture, I kind of thought about how I make pictures, and I thought these, I put these two in because um, usually if you take these roads, you drive down these private roads, you're always going to find a good shot. And it's kind of, I'm not advocating breaking and entering or anything like that, but there's always something usually down these roads. And this is, um, there's some new pictures are just made in Lucerne. And um, it's just, it's kind of funny how you can, well, maybe it's not funny, but kind of abandon your car in the middle of the road and get out and kind of find these things. But this is an example. Um, I wanted to talk about this amazing, amazing site in Naples, that again, that kind of adheres to these kind of ideas I was interested in about um, kind of the extreme kind of responses to the site. And you can see here this kind of spaghetti junction-esque kind of tangle of kind of roads, but it's, well, I managed to find a hole in the fence, <laughs> shall we say, at five in the morning, but um, it, it's kind of inaccessible, but I think it was kind of worth it to make um, this picture. This site is amazing. I mean, you could spend forever there making because the motorway just it kind of extends off into uh, all different directions the most extraordinary kind of uh, location um okay um slight change now i just in 2014 i had um an exhibition in front members luckily and it was a nice um kind of way of kind of exploring ideas of uh, how to work with the images because you know I'm shooting digitally so everything is kind of on your laptop the whole time and it's not often that you're kind of outputting stuff so it's this idea of exhibition as research and I was kind of coming towards the end of the project um, so I was kind of trying to think how to kind of deal with exhibiting work and how to show it and I was really interested in this picture by Zoffany obviously of kind of the massing of images. And so I, what I really wasn't interested in was this kind of polite pictures around the wall in kind of window mounts and kind of the white cube thing. So I kind of wanted to try and have this sort of installation, this kind of idea of the sort of massing of images and um, it's working with maps and, and just to make it more of a kind of an environment really. Um, so that was, yeah, that was a really amazing way to kind of work out what I didn't want to do. And so then kind of at the end of the project, you need to edit, you know, you've got this work. I've been working on it for on and off for kind of seven years. I've got hundreds and hundreds of pictures and, you know, you need to kind of, you need to come to some kind of conclusion about what it is that you're doing. So um, I think what's really important to know about when you make work is actually what not to include. And, you know, this idea that you have to remove your favorites from a project, you know, and that previous picture didn't fit because it was outside of the field of, uh, field of study. And this is one of the first pictures I made. And I really <laughs> like this picture, but it somehow it doesn't work because it's not about the motorway and the sublime, it's more about this is actually a cemetery. So this is an incredible retaining wall for the cemetery behind. And I think, you know, the picture is about that. So you have to sort of really be tough with yourself when you're working on kind of the final edit of a project. Um, and this is another example of something. This was in, uh, obviously again in Naples, but you know, this didn't work because of the format and the choices I made to make uh, this picture. But this kind of, this editing led me to the final piece of work. And um, 
when you do a, a PhD, you obviously have a exam or a viva, and you have to make this kind of presentation. And I made this ridiculous, huge box that's kind of um, yeah, it's a very Instagram-ish picture with my trainers. <laughs> but um, I made this enormous. But I think I kind of lost my mind a little bit actually, and it was I don't know, 60 by 60 or something. It was, yeah, that, I was just going to say that, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I made this kind of uh, photographic le uh, leporello, and it was 16 metres long, actually. And um, I think, kind of thinking about it now, I somehow like the perversity of making something that I couldn't actually show somehow. But um, anyway, so it was about this idea of how the images work as groups, and you could kind of unfold it and kind of they could be read individually they could be working as doubles you know they could work as this huge thing um and i just very quickly so i stick to the time um just show you the last few pictures from that it was i think there's 29 27 29 pictures in the in the leporello and the the photographs the kind of final pictures the final work they they kind of follow a kind of narrative, starting with this, where the kind of motorway is very small within the landscape. And there's, also, there's a kind of all, almost a kind of reversal of the sublime, really, here, where the, the landscape is, is the kind of sublime, in a sense, you know, and the motorway is kind of small and scaleless. And then and this is just a digital representation of the work. So you can see how the motorway kind of, or the architecture kind of travels moves up, extends out of the landscape and becomes almost, I think when I look back on my writing about it, I was sort of talking about it almost like being an animal somehow, kind of the way it, it sort of develops and comes out of the landscape and it comes into the city or the fringes of the city and then it, how it has to kind of connect with the city all the time in each of the photographs. It's dealing with this kind of extraordinary condition or proximity or light or scale or something like that. And then at the end of the series, how the kind of uh, the enormity of the kind of motorway architecture sort of takes over and it becomes this kind of uh, sort of canopy over the city in a way that sort of encloses the space and sort of overtakes everything but you know I didn't there's a kind of it's sort of easy in a way to make something really dystopian and I didn't want it to have that so the kind of the final image is something where it kind of it, it extends on and I'll show you that image now but um, just before and I show you this picture I was just setting up to make the picture and this is the most horrible place to take pictures it's really grim and flea bitten and this is all piles of trash everywhere and this amazing little white dog just ran into the scene just this perfect beautiful I don't know where it came from at all but um, and this is Anne Radcliffe who I also read this kind of gothic gothic novel and this is the end of the project where the kind of um, the motorway kind of goes off and kind of continues out of out of the frame and out of out of the scene there's um yeah there's a whole other kind of conversation to have about the kind of transformation of the sublime into the beautiful through photography but um that's a that's a whole other story but um there's an aware i have an awareness of that 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 is a factor within the work and just um yeah, just finally, um, just to sort of round up to where things are now. Last year, I was asked uh, by for, uh, Cartier Foundation in Paris to be part of a show about, well, the show was called Autophoto. It was an amazing show about the relationship between photography and cars, which is extraordinary. No one's ever kind of cura curated a show like that before, really. And it had Walker Evans, Robert Adams, Catherine Opie, Lee Friedlander, William Eggleston god like William Eggleston in it and um, these are just the three pictures I had in the show next to Hans Christian Shrink which was kind of um, interesting to have and um, this is kind of where I am now really um, and I'm very happy to have received the, the research bursary. I have to say thank you, big thank you to Mark and uh, Mike Weinstock for their support in that. And so I'm publishing, hopefully publishing a book of the project, but not as a PhD, but as a, as a book of the project. 
and um, working with Daily Lion, who uh, everyone, some people will know, really amazing designers here. And the publisher is Hartman Projects, based in Stuttgart, who are just the incredible, <laughs> I keep saying this, but you know, they, they've uh, published everyone from Robert Adams to um, Peter Bialobretsky and uh, Norman Behrens recently, and really fantastic people to work with. And um, it's really kind of honored to be working with them both. And that's kind of where the project is. The, the kind of bursary is, um, is sort of enabling that. Um, it's kind of a long thing to do to publish a book. It takes a long time, and, but it will get there. And I just finish by just showing you the last three pictures. These are my holiday photos. And the last uh, things I've been making around Luzerne, just um, kind of rethinking. These are just kind of tests, but um, just thinking about <coughs> things and still ideas, but trying to develop things a bit more. And this is the one that I really like. It works the best. And um, that's it. Thank you for listening. <laughs> I've got a microphone now. I'm just wondering if you um, if you connect in the same way when you're driving around motorways in the UK, because there is something less tragic about the hinterland of motorways here. You, you can picture the fact that you know we feel rather worried for you underneath some of those flyovers, you know. <laughs> and if it wasn't for that little white dog, I don't think you'd you know you'd kept your, your sanity very well in some of these gruesome places. But you mentioned Spaghetti Junction-like, mm. so you must have obviously had a connection with a UK motorway architecture as well as a, an Italian. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're just not very interesting. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> not very interesting. Um, yeah. It's just the desire to see the other and photograph something that's unfamiliar. I know a lot of photographers work, you know, we talk a lot in school about Guido Guidi because he works a lot with us in, in uh, our photography courses. But, you know, he, as an example, photographs at home, the, not all the time, but, you know, there's that tradition in Italian photography where people are, are shooting things that they're familiar with. And I just can't see stuff very can't see stuff very well when um, I'm here somehow. I like, and I like the extreme kind of situations and I, f I find the pictures, I can see them in a way that I, you know, the landscape is, is not enough here. It's too, um, it's too underwhelming somehow. I'm not answering the question very well, but I just, yeah. Okay, thanks Rich. I can hear you. Thank you. I think it's very interesting that uh, the to see your obsessions when you were doing your PhD, um, and I think it was beautifully described how your your PhD was all encompassing. You know, <laughs> people normally kind of never talk about their PhD or the experience of it. So I think that was really great. I mean, just recently I've been reading Susan Sontag on two oh. essays, one on sensibility, it's actually about camp, but she talks about sensibility and then another one about low and high culture. And mm -hmm. I think it is rather amazing how you retraced uh, the steps of the kind of 18th century in a sense, and that she produced the sensibility, but not the product. And I think, I think that's really fantastic because it's very contemporary, even though actually a lot of the motorways are really in the past, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
But I think that's really what's so beautiful about them, actually, is the fact that, that you've created the sensibility that they were looking for, but it's a 21st century sensibility, so I think it's... I think that side, which is not the academic side of your no, beauty, no, worked course. extremely well. <laughs> Thank you. So congratulations. I think. Yeah, no, I, it didn't, you don't want to have some kind of kitsch, kind of, you know, revival of sort of 18th century. I'm not going to go around shooting glass plates or whatever. You know, I've got a wooden tripod. That's my homage to O'Sullivan. <laughs> so, you know, I, that's enough, really. But thank you, Carlos. I think maybe the, the, the British motorways just don't, you know, it would be a gritty photograph rather than yeah, reach that sensibility. Kind of... So maybe it's not that they're not as nice. It's just maybe if you're searching for sensibility, then it maybe becomes there's landscapes banal. that were painted were there, you know, yeah. and they were there for that reason. And I think maybe you were, your instinct was right to follow and also that there's landscape this... tradition, you know, rather than... Yeah, absolutely. There's this thing about irony, you know, and it kind of becomes too kind of cool and look at this, you know. Yes, I'm not interested in the banal or kind of coolness or irony at all so um yeah thank you uh hi um thank you for the talk it was really good thank to you. hear uh like a more in-depth uh view on this i was uh, wondering, like, have you ever uh, looked at this? Because you, you you showed some photos, some pictures that you had um, that, that didn't make it into your PhD, and they kind of like uh, the, the early ones that you showed, and they were kind of flat, and there was no uh, gravitas to them in a way. Yeah. And uh, but you were starting to find uh, your way into this story, and and I wonder if you uh, if I'm seeing double or your uh, in. In, in this case and, uh, you know, the, the most, um, the ones where you're like, where you see this, like, you know, where, where there are like these really strong perspectives of these bioducts, uh, are you seeing these as characters? Have you ever looked at them as characters in a story or are they simply things? Because really there is a tension, like when, especially the ones that like cross, uh, you know, uh, inhabit, you know, areas like buildings and, you know, like not the ones in nature, but also those ones, but perhaps less, it's maybe less obvious, yeah. but the ones that, and yeah, I don't know, I'm just l looking at this and seeing this progression. I think like there was this new like angle. I don't know if that's yeah. something from. No, I think, so. I think they're more like animals yeah. <laughs> than people, <laughs> but yeah, no, definitely. I, it's this kind of thing of it being this kind of creature striding across the city somehow. I don't know, it becomes, yeah, yes, is the answer. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for coming.